All right. Hi. Let's start with the Chris K study. I'm going to go over three major things with you. First, I want to go over the format of a case study so that's clear. Second, I would like to go over the methods of data analysis that will make this a, a little easier for you. And finally, I want to go over the answer so that you can finally write this thing up. Let's dive in. Remember that you have to read the question and we'll be taking a look at the first um, part of what you have to complete for the case study, which is identifying strengths and or needs, which I have circled on your screen for you right here. The next thing that you have to do is give two specific instructional strategies that will be drawn from primarily the major issue that you identify in the case study. Finally, you need to offer two benefits or explanations, which I prefer to call benefits, for whatever lesson plans it happens to be that you are proposing. Now the format that tends to work best, remember, is a simple five paragraph essay and I will briefly write these in the leftmost margin for you where you will identify, for example, strength one, you will have um, strength two, you'll identify a major issue, and then you're going to, of course, support that with A and B. A and B will be pairs of issues you look at, for example, perhaps vocabulary and comprehension perhaps sight words and decodable words, phonics rules, and the like. Paragraph 4 is where you will d develop a lesson for whatever A happened to be, and paragraph 5 will be where you will develop a lesson for whatever B happens to be. And then for both of these lessons, you have to state a benefit. And um, you need to be very careful with uh, how you write the benefits, and we will certainly go over that. Let me cut to a uh, blank screen for you right now, if I may, and just show you a couple of uh, things to, uh, to note. Our five paragraph essay and that outline that you will write in your test booklet will help you best if you remember the list of words that you and I have been working with. For example, we have concepts about print, we have phonemic awareness, those are the foundations. We move to onsets and rhymes. We move then to the, well, actually I made a mistake, let me back up, I'm sorry about that. Letter sound correspondence, onsets and rhymes, the phonics rules, polysyllabic words, sight words, and then the flu, fluency, the big one. I'm not going to go any further because for this kindergarten kid, <clears throat> we know we're not dealing with much beyond uh, the foundations and beginning decoding. So if you just remember to make your five paragraph essay and you remember what all of those paragraphs serve and the purpose they serve, which briefly again is strength one, strength two, the major issue A and B, and then lesson A and benefit A, and lesson B and benefit B, this uh, uh, tool will uh, really serve you well. So let's uh, take a look then at his data. We'll do that right now and see where he's at. Now we get the concepts about print data first. We can see that he has book, he has sentence, he has word uh, concepts. I will scroll this up so that you can take a look then at his letter identification. And in that letter identification you can see quite plainly that he has most of the upper and most of the lower with the exception of these infrequent letters right here. The infrequent letters X, Y, and Z in the lowercase, and then his letter confusions right here. So while we're quite pleased with this progress, we do see that there are some things that are lagging. We're not going to panic because we expect such things to, to lag a little bit. For phonemic awareness on the next page of his data set, you can see that he has initial and final sounds because you can see his pat bat, his take tug and the initial uh, and final sounds he was able to produce. The only thing that he didn't have much success with were the R control sounds, but again, we would expect those to lag. Rhyming is not so critical. Uh, we can certainly take a look at that, and, and we will, just to note that he has it, because what you and I are most concerned about is his ability to get through blending and segmenting, particularly segmenting. When you look at his blending, he is successful with all aspects of blending. When you look at segmenting, he is successful with all aspects of segmenting. So we can put uh, one giant happy face right here. I don't mean to be silly, but we are quite enthusiastic about this because remember, segmenting predicts success. And since this is a child who has the ability to segment, we would expect that he 
is um, going to be a successful decoder. Moreover, he is probably ready to decode. We know that he is ready to, to decode because when we looked at his ability to name upper and lowercase letters that are in place, and now we can combine them. We can combine them into uh, a decoding lesson. So let's uh, turn the page and take a look at what it tells us. Well, on his sight word inventory, again, very successful with that, so we'll put a happy face next to it. We look at his language experience approach, and I'll only do the analysis on the first one. This tells us much about concepts about print, for example. We know that he has some directionality. We know that he understands word boundaries. We know that he understands, for example, capitalizing the first letter. But this also gives us some information about what type of letter sound correspondence he has and any onsets and or rhymes that he possesses. Well, as far as letter sounds go, you can see that he's producing like puttle and fr. In other words, he knows that the letter P and the letter L represent sounds. We also know that in friends, he knows that the letter F and the letter R represent the sounds. And they're appropriate because if you look at the kid to English translation down below, he was quite successful with that. He is able to write a sight word at. But that sight word is an important one because it doubles as a rhyme. That sight word can be used as a rhyme. As a matter of fact, we can bring this rhyme that he has back to the first page of his data. Go ahead and turn to that if you would. And look down at the lowercase letter naming that he completed. On that lowercase letter identification, you can see how you can take his known rhyme at, pair it with his secure consonants. For example, let me clear some of this out of here a little bit. You can see how you can pair that rhyme with the letter C to make cat, the letter F to make fat, the letter R to make rat, the letter H to make hat, etc. You wouldn't do bat because it's not secure, um, and you wouldn't do pat because he's overgeneralizing the letter P to a variety of different letters. But you certainly can take the secure consonant and the secure rhyme and begin to get him to, to decode. So if we go back then to our uh, notes, we can say that he has concepts about print and phonemic awareness. There is evidence of letter sound correspondence. There is evidence of onsets and rhymes, particularly the rhyme at would be our greatest concern. He also has sight words. The rest of the stuff on the list would be out because he's not decoding yet. Concepts about print, well, if we were to name anything that's lagging, it would be P and B and D and Q. I don't think I'd bother even discussing the rhyming portion for phonemic awareness. Instead, I would go to my outline. I would write in that he has cap. I would write in that he has phonemic awareness. The order is arbitrary. You can put phonemic awareness first, concepts last, it doesn't matter. We know that in this kid's case that we have to start decoding. We also know that we have to address the confusions P, B, D, and Q, and that we have to start onset and rhyme instruction. We know that our, lang that our first activity for A is, will, will be simply that trace and say stuff. We do that because it is multisensory. We know for lesson B that we're going to do making words. And we also do making words because it is multisensory. In fact, all of the activities on here are multisensory. So what we need to do now, um, after I sum up, is uh, learn how to write this up in, in a, a good quality essay. So let me summarize what we've done so far. The first thing we did is we looked at how to outline the case study, how to use our terminology um, in a list that we'll check off, and then we analyzed the data very quickly and filled out our outline and even, even added in our activities. So now we're ready to go on to the writing. All right, let's uh, go over this answer and uh, do it quickly. Hopefully, um, it'll record clearly on your screen. I can't guarantee that, though, so um, you may have to uh, just strain your vision a little bit until I get better at it. All right, anyway, the Chris case study. Remember, it's a five-paragraph essay. The first paragraph is where we're going to identify strength one, and I've circled strength one in your uh, window right now. Paragraph two is where we will cite strength number two. In paragraph number three, I used to call this like need evidence and two related subneeds, but that's a little too academic. Look, it's best if you just identify the major issue that the child is having, support it with evidence, and then pick out 
need A and then need B, and just make sure that it's very clear as to what you're saying need A happens to be and what you're saying need B happens to be. Now your outline is done. I'm not going to flip back to that, but you already did an outline for this, so you know what's supposed to go in paragraph 1 and paragraph 2 and paragraph 3. Now when I went over this in class, remember, I didn't like my opening at all, and let me highlight that on your, your screen. What I don't like about it is that I'm not getting to the point quickly enough. I think it would be best if you said something like Chris's first strength is whatever it is. And in this case, it happens to be concepts about print. It's interchangeable. Remember, you could put phonemic awareness first or concepts about print. But nonetheless, you want to immediately come out and say that his first strength is whatever it happens to be. I would lead off the same way for paragraph number two. As you can see, I'm a little bit roundabout in the way I do it, and so I would, you know, lead right off and say his second strength is whatever it happens to be. And so try to get in the habit of just getting to the point. Now, most of what I have in paragraph number one is my supporting evidence is fine, with the exception of what you see um, that I'm going to cross out right now. That last sentence isn't any good. So let me take it from the top. Obviously, I would say that Chris's first strength is concepts about print, and I would say that uh, we see this on his observation checklist. He understands all the principal parts of a book, including how print carries meaning, where to start reading text, and in which direction to read. I would get rid of that last sentence and instead make sure that I say that he is quite good at letter naming. And remember the significance of letter naming. That's his letter naming, believe it or not. The point of letter naming is this. It is the summative portion of concepts about print. That's what you're aiming the child towards. So if he has letter naming, be sure that you say it because it's one of the exit criteria for kindergarten and the starting point for letter sound correspondence when the child is ready to do it. So in paragraph number two, everything is fine except for my lead in. I would change that again to his second strength is. And then notice I say table 5.2 right here. Well, there isn't any table 5.2. It's called a phonemic awareness inventory. So be sure that you're using the language phonemic awareness inventory for that particular assessment piece. Everything else is fine. It does reflect his ability to blend. It does reflect his ability to segment but my examples are incorrect. So be sure that you swap out the examples, soft for soft, and tell as t, i, u, or whatever. Swap that out and put in things that he was really able to blend and really able to segment. The rest of my paragraph is, uh, is just fine. Um, and it's just fine because I, I show them that I understand the significance of blending and segmenting. Namely, that they are the foundations for learning to decode text and are the most advanced phonemic awareness activities. Therefore, you'll want to be saying uh, roughly the same thing when you write this up. For paragraph number three, it's a very critical paragraph because in that paragraph we have to state what the major issue is. So when we identify the major issue, which is that these strengths indicate he's ready to begin phonics instruction since he can uh, name letters and can segment, I lead right off with that issue. The next thing you've got to do is identify need A and need B, and those are very easy. This child is still having some difficulty with letters that are orthographically similar. In other words, just the visually similar letters like P, B, D, and Q. And you can certainly pause this and read over my paragraph, but I would tighten it up a bit. I would say his first need is, and then list it out. And then when you get to need B, I would say again, his second need is, and his second need is just to take that known rhyme at and begin to pair it with secure consonants like cat, hat, mat, sat, rat, etc., and get this child decoding. That's really what must happen. So that takes care of the first three paragraphs. Strength one, strength two, the major issue, A and B. So go back over the data uh, if you need to and uh, take a look at what's going on. All right, let's take a look at the fourth and fifth paragraphs. These are very easy. Paragraph four, remember, is the paragraph where we are going to um, begin with our lesson plan. Watch how I introduce it. I say, to help Chris overcome his visual discrimination difficulties, I would use a multi-sensory technique. Well, the only thing that's going on in here is that I restate need 
A. If visual discrimination was need A, restate it in paragraph 4, and then tell them what lesson plan you're going to use. I said multisensory technique. You could certainly say trace and say. It doesn't really make a difference. Now, the rest of that uh, paragraph that's highlighted in black on your screen simply describes a trace and say lesson plan that I would do, and it includes clear teacher modeling, clear guided practice, and clear independent practice. So let me highlight that in blue and read it to you right now. I would have Chris trace sandpaper letters B and D while thinking aloud. I would model how to say down, up, and around to form B, and around, up, and down to form D, and then have him repeat it. Then I would have him identify these letters in a variety of text to reinforce his learning in a new context. Finally, I would have him write each letter down each day until he can both read and write them fluently. Okay, that's a fine lesson, very short. You may wish to also draw to indicate um, where it is and, and what it is that you're going to have them trace and say, that may help. The last thing you want to end with is the benefit. And look at how I write the benefit. I say Chris would benefit from these letter, the, from these multisensory activities because he would learn to discriminate these problematic letters by using a sense of sight, touch, and hearing to correctly identify them. The benefit does not say that multisensory activities are fun or trace and say is great. It goes into some detail about how it works, why it works, and you've got to do the same thing or you're going to get hammered on it. So don't, don't mess it up. Now look at my opening for uh, paragraph number five. It parallels what I just went over. I say to help Chris learn to decode simple CVC words. I would focus on basic onset rhyme instruction using his known consonants and known rhyme at. And again, this is quite simple. It's quite simple because you can see clearly, very clearly, how I am restating need be and then telling them the lesson I'm going to use. You can see right in here where I am writing up the lesson. It includes modeling, guided, and independent practice. I say I would use a pocket chart with the consonants on one line and his rhyme on the other. We would work together to create and read new words with each of the known consonants. Finally, I would add as known sight words to a decodable sentence such as the cat sat on the mat and ask him to read it. Certainly, you can draw very quickly a pocket chart to show them exactly what it is that you're going to do. You would have, for example, the onset C and the onset M and the onset R and the known rhyme at right here, and he's going to make the words cat, mat, and rat. The last thing that I state then is his benefit or the benefit of the activity, and the benefit is in blue. Look at how long-winded and explicit I am. By looking at the words, saying the initial known consonants, and then adding the known rhyme, Chris would learn to decode simple short vowel CVC words using basic onset rhyme instruction. He would also learn to read a sentence with these decodable words and known sight words in a sentence. So to sum this portion up, then, you can see clearly how it is a very tight five-paragraph essay which states strength one, strength two, the major issue, A and B, followed by the lesson in paragraph four and the lesson in paragraph five along with the benefits along with the benefits to support it so you may um, wish to copy this answer let me scroll it down and if you want to pause and uh, do a little copying go ahead and do that now and then I will scroll it up uh, right now and you can just pause between uh, both of the beginning and the ending portions in order to get this stuff uh, uh, written out. Okay, that's it for me. Bye.